Hi, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Um, yeah, we look forward to chatting. We'll be shedding the light on solar within community schemes. Enjoy. Um, we'll be presented by Billy Ruiz, CEO of Stratafin, Aubrey Snayman of Multi -prop, uh, Property Intelligence, and Glenn Van der Weber from MaxLight. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Um, Thanks so much, um, guys. Yeah, uh, we're discussing shedding the light on solar within the community schemes industry. I uh, think a very important um, topic that needs to be had um, now, seeing the problems that we are experiencing in South Africa and the problems that ESCOM is experiencing, um, and uh, schemes need to make sure that they can provide um, electricity or um, people require electricity and require their schemes to assist with that and so forth. So we're going to have a discussion about solar energy or renewable energy um, in general. Um, so energy that is derived from the sun uh, through photovoltaic cells um, that then generates power from, from the sun's energy. Um, the big problem that we sit with photovoltaic cells is that they in general produce electricity during the day. Most people are not at the scheme during the day. And as such, the electricity that is generated um, is not really utilized. So surely that must then be coupled with something else like a battery inverter system and so forth. Um, and then to produce electricity. So Glenn will have, and during our conversation before we started, we had a chat about uh, the problems with batteries and so forth, and Glenn will touch on that when he chats as well, um, and the risks in respect of batteries. So, so it is a, it's a very important um, discussion, and we need to look at all the aspects that has an influence on that. Um, so there is some new technology coming along. Um, one of the universities in America has now patented a system where um, electricity can be produced at night. It um, works on the uh, temperature difference um, that, that uh, happens during the cooling of Earth, um, and that is then utilized in respect of, of the production of electricity. Um, a Chinese university is busy with a technology where the drops of rain um, actually causes a friction and that creates electricity. Um, so there are very um, different innovative ideas out there that is being utilized, which will then make it possible for people to produce energy during nighttime and other times when it rains and so forth um, without having the need of batteries. Um, but even on the um, score of batteries there is also some changes that are taking place currently most batteries or the better batteries um, that, that last the longest periods of time and so forth is your lithium ion battery um, and lithium is not a very abundant mineral um, in, in the world and as such the cost of these batteries are very very high and people that have looked at uh, the renewable or solar energy solutions um, have seen that that is actually the main cost um, of a system is your battery cost um, that you pay. Um, so there is a new technology on the horizon. It is a sodium ion battery. So it's made of salt, um, one of the most abundant minerals on the earth. Um, so we are seeing some changes um, currently the life time or the usage time of that battery is not as long as a lithium ion battery, um, but they are making significant inroads in respect of that as well. So I had some very interesting reading uh, when I started reading about solar energy in general um, in for this uh, uh, solar energy webinar community schemes. Uh, Busi, can you move to the next slide for us, please? Okay, so the stuff that needs to be considered, um, obviously, is ownership. Um, in respect of ownership in general, uh, when we talk about sectional title schemes and not homeowners associations, um, we, we sit with the problem that uh, the community scheme actually owns the, the, the common property or people own then that in, in the, as part of the um, 
of the section or unit. Um, but in general, the ownership lies not with the owner and as such, the roofs or the carports or whatever space, um, open space in the scheme, all of that um, is, is owned by the scheme and a owner cannot, um, cannot just go and install systems and do whatever they want because it's done on the common property. So from that point of view, um, we need to look at ownership um, we also need to look at um, equipment, ownership of equipment, who's going to own the equipment, is it going to be owned by the scheme, is it going to be owned by an owner himself in respect of a section, or is it going to be owned by a third party provider. So there are different options available and that needs to be considered. The other stuff that needs to be considered is the aesthetic considerations, what it's, how it's going to have an impact on how the scheme looks. Um, I have seen schemes where these panels have been placed over um, skylights um, and being sticking over the roofs and so forth. Um, so definitely have an effect on how the scheme looks. Um, and at the end of the day, how a scheme looks has an effect on the value of your property. So definitely something that needs to be taken into consideration is the aesthetic value um, and considerations. Then a, another consideration is the structural consideration in respect of your roof. If you're going to put it on there, can your trusses hold these panels? Um, so we are in a sectional title office scheme and um, the engineering report actually says to us that uh, the scheme's trusses cannot hold the additional weight of panels. So as a tenant in a scheme like that, I can't put panels up and the only alternative for me is a battery um, that I can recharge from the ESCOM grid and then from there um, uh, get my power once uh, we are in a load shedding situation and so forth. So definitely important that a scheme consider the, construct, uh, the structural considerations in this regard, um, legal considerations. So how is it done? That also goes hand in hand with the ownership. So um, on what basis can it be put on there? Can it be put on by the scheme? Do they have the right to do so? Who has the right? Is it the trustees? or must the owners be, uh, be consulted? So we're gonna have a look at that. Uh, then financial considerations, how is it paid? Um, is it going to be paid by a special levy? Or are we going to pay it out of our reserve funds? Can we pay it out of our reserve funds? Um, are we going to allow owners to do it themselves and then carry the cost of that? Where's, going, where's the burden of um, maintenance going to lie? Um, will the scheme maintain, will the owner maintain, all those things need to be taken into consideration in respect of the financial considerations. Um, then insurance, um, who's going to insure this um, equipment that is installed there, if it's on common property, is the obligation with the scheme, is the obligation with the owner, how are we going to deal with those things? Slide please, Bussi. Okay, so if we look at um, the, um, the legislative considerations that we need to take into consideration, we must look at this, the Sectional Title Schemes Management Act, uh, probably also the Sectional Titles Act. Aubrey will speak about that a bit later on when we're dealing with uh, exclusive use areas and the creation thereof and how it is legally created. Um, then your prescribed management rules and your prescribed conduct rules. So those are the, the main legislative levers that we have to look at and decide how we are going to do. So in terms of the Sectional Title Schemes Management Act, Section 13 and 13E specifically deal with the non-causing of a nuisance. So in that sense, um, somebody that installs a system onto the roofs of the complex without the permission um, is doing so um, without permission and as such is doing so on property that does not belong to them and that can cause a nuisance and a hazard for the scheme um, and trustees are um, 
uh, obligated to actually take that into consideration and as such um, require there is a requirement that uh, the necessary permission be obtained uh, section 14.1 also deals with insurance um, of the scheme and as i said we need to look where that um, insurance burden will lie will it lie on the scheme or will it lie on owners uh, section 14 does give provision where a decision can be made to move the burden away from the scheme to the owner um, but then permission is also required um, to to give that um, to the owner and the owner must then ensure and the body corporate will then have the obligation to ensure that that insurance stays in place because obviously if it is not done it can have a dramatic effect on the scheme itself um, your prescribed management rules city also deals with uh, nuisance so we've had a look at nuisance that specifically um, deals with how it should be dealt with by the trustees so look at prescribed management rule 30b um, and ensure that these installations do not cause a nuisance um, Prescribed Management Rule 30D then deals with um, the alterations um, that can impair the stability of the building or interfere with the use and enjoyment of somebody else in respect of the scheme. So if you're going to install your panels on the open space because you now believe that you have the right to do so, you're definitely going to interfere with the use and enjoyment of somebody else, especially if you put it right next to the swimming pool in this little piece of open space next to the pool and people can't lie next to the pool any longer and enjoy the sun um, for a bit of tanning. Um, so definitely from that point of view, um, there will also be a requirement on the trustees to ensure that there isn't an alteration that impairs the safety of the, and the stability of the scheme, the trusses will hold it or wherever it is installed, but will be able to, to hold that. It's not going to cause additional risks. Uh, Glenn will speak about that later on, as I said, about the batteries, um, some additional risk that is being caused by those batteries. Um, and as such, that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, also, in terms of prescribed management rule 30, um, one cannot do things that have a negative effect on the value or uh, utility of a section. And as such, if you're going to install uh, panels and you're going to install it over the skylights of other people's units and so forth, that will definitely have a material effect and a negative effect on the value of that uh, section and as such um, a consent is required in terms of the rules. Owners are also not allowed in terms of the conduct rules to make changes to the scheme um, or the outside of the scheme, the external appearance of these units without the necessary consent um, and that is in terms of prescribed management rule five um, that require that consent and the trustees need to take that into consideration and need to look at what is going to happen with all these different panels that are being placed onto uh, the roofs and wherever they're going to be placed. Um, one also needs to consider when a owner sells his unit or is it going to be sold with the panels in place? Will those panels be removed? What will be the effect on the stability of the building uh, when these panels are removed constantly and people are constantly on the roof to put their own panels up, somebody else is drilling now into the truss again through the, through the tiles or the corrugated iron or whatever the roof might be. Um, so that needs to be considered because there is going to be a problem in that respect as well. We'll see. Okay, so um, I think one of the first questions um, that was raised a, a couple of months ago when we started um, having all this uh, tremendous, tremendous amount of load shedding is one of, one of a scheme in Durban contacted us and wanted to know what the situation would be in respect of a multi-story building and they only have one roof. So where will people in this multi-story building be able to put their panels? Um, will they be able to put them outside their window? Um, 
some other way connect them to the outside of the building? Will they, will they be able to put them on the roof? If they put them on the roof, who will get permission to put on? Who will not get permission? When the space is taken, um, what will happen to those owners uh, that then come in later and say, now I also want to put my panels up. So there's a, a huge amount of questions that needs to be answered in respect of this. So all schemes don't have the ability to, or the space where panels can be placed onto the roofs of the schemes um, that will be sufficient for every, each and every unit in the scheme. So, so schemes need to consider, are we going to allow this? Are we going to go down this route? Will there be sufficient space? Um, and what the other um, factors are that impact? Um, what is the impact on the scheme in general in this regard? So the trustees need to do a feasibility study. Um, they need to look at a single solar system. Uh, they need to look at a solar system where owners put their own systems on. So do a feasibility, go and check things out, make sure that you guys know what you are going to get yourselves into, and then make the decision what you want to do. Also look at other systems. There is, for example, and we'll talk about that a bit later on as well, um, systems that is installed by third parties. Um, in general, they call the power purchase agreement systems um, where the scheme then purchase electricity from that. So go and have a look at all those different options, um, weigh them up and then make a determination what is important for your scheme and what is feasible in your scheme. Because it is not a one fit all system where we can just say for every scheme, this is what will be the best and that's going to be how it must be done in each and every scheme. So schemes will have to take their own facts into consideration. The added benefit of a single use um, solution is um, that it serves the common property areas. Um, it serves your shared security system, such as your CCTVs, your alarms, your fences and so forth. And it also reduces the noise and the pollution of these big generators that are standing at the entrances of schemes to make sure that these things happen. It also then creates a situation where the risk of these generators being stolen um, is, is minimized because the panels are on the roof and um, it, it is a, a far safer and cleaner option if it fits your scheme. Thanks, Lucy. Okay, so the question is the authorization or the consent that is required. Okay, so we said in terms of prescribed management rule 29, alterations or improvements that are not reasonably necessary requires a unanimous resolution. So one must first determine if if this, is, uh, if this is an improvement that is reasonably necessary, I think in South Africa, we have come to the conclusion that it is now reasonably necessary, especially if we hear um, that we now moving to load um, shedding schedule eight to nine and 10 and so forth. So I think we can, we can safely say that it is reasonably necessary. Um, if it's reasonably necessary, we then must apply 29.2. Which says that the trustees can make a decision, but they're not entitled to implement that until they've given 30 days notice to owners um, that they're going to do that, what the cost will be, how they will raise the funds, what the need is that is being serviced. Um, and the members can then, within that 30 day period, request a special general meeting where this can be discussed. And at that meeting, a decision needs to be made. And that is a um, special resolution that, that needs to be applied. Okay. Um, when we're dealing with owner implementation systems, so where uh, owner is going to get the right on a portion, portion of the common property to put his equipment. Um, we're going to deal specifically with, with the creation of exclusive use areas. Um, those can be created in terms of your prescribed conduct rules. So there you require a special resolution. Um, or they can be created in terms of the prescribed management rules where you then require unanimous resolution. Uh, what's important is then we 
we look at the um, owner's responsibility because in terms of section 13, if I remember correctly, of the sectional title scheme management act, the requirement of an owner in terms of the uh, exclusive use area is to keep it neat and tidy and the balance of the responsibility for maintenance and upkeep falls on the body corporate so this needs to be moved um, and you need to then make changes to your rules to move this um, so that the responsibility does not fall on the body corporate once somebody has installed pan panels on the roof um, so we need to make sure Insurance is then dealt with in those rules, uh, in those rules, and also the removal and the insurance and the maintenance and upkeep and so forth. Uzi, can you move us? Okay, funding. Um, trustees can convene a special general meeting, um, and then by ordinary resolution. Um, they can get an authorization to use existing saved up funds for this expense. So they can do that. If you have some money in your kitty, then you can do it like that. Um, if there's no reserve fund, uh, the trustees can raise a special levy, levy if the expense is necessary and unbudgeted for and cannot wait for a further period. Um, I think we're getting to a situation where one will be able to make an argument that you can't wait for it. So you can then raise it by special levy. That will de depend on scheme to scheme. Um, then there are other options loaned by the body corporate to install. Um, so a company like Stratafin would uh, then give loans to a body corporate and that will be paid over a defined period of time at a defined interest rate. So that is also an option. Uh, there are lease options out there, so where a scheme do not own the system, but is uh, renting it from somebody else and paying a monthly fee. And then there's the power purchase agreement option where somebody else installs it and the body corporate purchase the electricity from that um, service provider. Um, and in essence, is paying for the scheme um, through the members um, payment of electricity and uh, there is a rebate that goes to the body corporate and such they pay for it. Um, so, so that is also an option that is available in the market. Okay, some other considerations um, that the body corporate must take into consideration. Um, body corporate must obtain replacement valuations on a three yearly basis, which they then need to put to the owners, obviously, when this is put onto the scheme, that needs to be done immediately. So immediately evaluation, and this is where the scheme owns the system. Uh, they would immediately have to value that, and they would immediately have to include that into their insurance. That will definitely have a um, knock-on effect on the levies because the insurance premium will probably rise, and as such, your uh, levies will will have to rise in that respect as well. Um, and then. Prescribed Management Rule 23 um, requires that the trustees also obtain the replacement valuation of those panels then and infrastructure um, associated with, with it and then present it at the next AGM. Thanks, Lucy. A quick chat about the so-called um, Tax breaks, unfortunately, the bad news is that it is not available to a scheme. It's only available to individuals. The minister specifically said that there was no uh, demand as far as they could see from schemes for a tax break like this. I think from an industry, we should make it very clear that there is a demand and that they start looking at that. So the tax break that was announced in the budget is not applicable to schemes and cannot be used by schemes at all. Okay, we see. Thank you, Busi. Aubrey? Oh, thank you very much, Willie. Uh, I thought Glenn was going to go first, but let me quickly uh, deal with, uh, with uh, the three types of ownership. Um, and I think this is common sense for most people, but uh, in our dealings with owners and even trustees, I think one of the biggest issues is that uh, the understanding of exactly what sectional title is. So for the very informed ones of you, uh, just uh, bear with us for a minute. Um, 
we just want to explain this because this lies at the core of a lot of problems that we have as far as solar on the roofs is concerned. Um, of course, in sectional title in the complex, we have, uh, in a way, three different ways of, of ownership, of which the most important one is uh, the section. And so when you buy in a complex, you obviously buy your section, means the inside of your unit split in the middle of the outside wall, as well as an undivided share in the common property. So that's what you buy. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Okay, and then uh, the, the other uh, type of ownership that you already, that you buy into is of course the common property that is uh, uh, the undivided share that you have. And basically that is everything on the outside of sections is somehow uh, common property. And then uh, on the next slide, please, uh, we have a special type of, common property and that is exclusive use area that must be registered in some way and we will look at that now um, a, a part of the problems that we have is what we call the de facto uh, exclusive use areas where people by means of what they think they bought often explained or uh, when a, a, a unit is sold the property pr practitioner involved will tell the buyer that, listen, you buying the garden, uh, you buying the carport, all of those things. If it's not registered somewhere, it is not an exclusive use area. And um, uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, if you look at the bird's eye view from common property, of course, everything that we would look at uh, would be common property, including all the roofs. And uh, I think you can go to the next slide, please. Um, what we need to uh, consider when we look at common property is, uh, and or the, uh, yeah, uh, the section, is that your section technically stops uh, at your ceiling. So it's not only the roof area that is common property and thus you, you don't have any say on it. Uh, it's also the area between the ceiling and the tiles. So if you want to install the batteries, for instance, in that area, that would also be common property. So one need to deal with the ownership of that. And uh, the two ways to register uh, exclusive use areas with or without using all the legal jargon is basically on the sectional title plan done by the land surveyor and typically that is mostly only done in new schemes when uh, exclusive use areas form part of it from the beginning not many of those around and especially i haven't seen any uh, sectional title plan where exclusive use areas was registered for roofed areas. This is a, a, a new uh, development and maybe in the new schemes we will find that, but up to now you can be 99.9% .9 sure that your roofed areas will be common property and therefore no individual owner can deal with it. Um, that is unfortunately quite an expensive way of going about it and uh, it's not really recommended or necessary if we look at solars on the roof. Um, the other way that is more common and that we are involved in very often is, um, is to uh, create exclusive use area plans. Um, you can go to the next slide for us. Um, whereby areas and that include typically it would be gardens it would be uh, parking areas carports things like that anything that is seen by owners as being used for their own purpose uh, that that is registered in uh, in an exclusive use area plan of which we have a sample here and with that 
we recommend that uh, the solar issue is dealt with by registering uh, areas of roofs to, uh, to specific units or for all the units areas so that uh, panels can be uh, put onto the roofs. Uh, of course, we need to comply with a lot of conditions and we need to, to do some proper uh, due diligence uh, before that is allowed. There's various aspects that, uh, that can cause problems if it's not done properly. Um, one of the issues, as Willy also mentioned, is that we need to ensure <clears throat> that the distribution of the uh, exclusive use areas for uh, units is fair and uh, that we uh, make sure that each and every unit, according to the PQ, if that's the, how, how the uh, complex want to do it, can have enough viable roof area. And therefore, it is important for uh, trustees to undertake an investigation on how many uh, of the roof area is suitable for panels. Uh, it's no use uh, allocating half of the, the northern north facing part to some units and uh, the others um, southern facing or in the shade of trees uh, where it will not be effective. So we need to be fair to all our um, to all our owners and a practicality also that one should consider is that while it's common property, the gardens, the trees and stuff in there obviously is common property as well. As soon as that becomes exclusive use areas, it becomes more difficult for the body corporate to deal with those trees. So it might be uh, necessary to investigate if certain trees need to be removed uh, to make it possible to provide enough north facing uh, sunny areas for the complex. Um, next slide, please. Um, okay. What should be in, uh, indicated on the exclusive use area plan? Uh, on the plan, if we prepare it for a complex, we need to uh, draw all the existing sections, obviously to scale, indicating the location of the distinctively, distinctively numbered exclusive use and the enjoyment part and the purpose for which these parts are to be used. So on the plan, we will uh, survey the outside lines of the exclusive use areas we will put in the distances, the square metrage of it, and then uh, indicate on, on a plan where uh, every uh, exclusive use area is allocated to a specific section. And specifically then with that, what it is to be used for. So if it is allocated for a, a courtyard, you can't enclose it and make a, a living room from it. Uh, NL, for any changes, of course, it needs to go through all the necessary uh, steps at the body corporate uh, before these plans can be uh, approved. And eventually they will form part of changes to rules that will cover uh, what, how this will be dealt with. And next slide, please. Okay. Um, if we look at the amendment of rules, and uh, this is with the compliments of the Linda van der Merwe that uh, deals with uh, all the rules where we are involved in the plans. Um, this is the legal description of how it is allowed. And uh, you can read that on your own. I don't want to waste time on that. So there is legal uh, way to amend the rules. And it can, of course, be in the management rules or it can be in the conduct rules. Next slide, please. Um, okay. Um, we just want to quickly have a look without going into details of the type 
of aspects that we need to cover in the rules. Uh, and as I said, this should be uh, put into place by uh, people in the know. I never recommend that trustees uh, do their own rules uh, or body corporate. It is just too technical and it's so easy to get yourself into trouble if it's not, not done properly. So the first uh, rule that one should have in is that you need written application from the trustees even if it's your exclusive use area to install a solar on the roof uh, or anywhere on, on your exclusive use area. And that uh, application should of course include things like all the components you're going to uh, use, a plan and photographs of uh, exactly what you want to do to ensure that uh, you do not negatively affect the aesthetics of the complex. Uh, you need to say how the insurance is, is going to, to be affected of your section. Uh, uh, you need to have uh, input on the roof structure's capability to deal with the weight of the structures you want to put on. And then of course, it must not negatively impact on any structures or the waterproofing or important, the fire integrity of, of the, the complex at all. Then um, the owners will be made responsible for maintenance, repairs and replacements. If anything goes wrong, <clears throat> the owner will be responsible for the removal or the decommissioning of the installed system, should that be necessary or required at any stage. The owner will be responsible for damages on common property caused by the installation. And uh, one must uh, keep in mind that it's not only the panels uh, and the batteries, there's cabling that must be done from the panels to the batteries. And it may be that you need to um, go through another section or definitely over common property if these are uh, attached to walls, that is common property. And the, <clears throat> the owner will be uh, responsible for all costs and, and uh, associated issues. <clears throat> the body corporate will reserve the right uh, to inspect the roofed areas at any stage. Um, and the owner will be responsible will be responsible if any changes need to be made to the roof area for the installation of, of panels. Uh, if the angle is not correct or whatever, that would be for the cost of the uh, body corporate, or for the owner that wants to do it. And then of course, the body corporate will not be liable for any damages at all. Um, it's just a brief description of the type of things one needs to look at but again, as I said, uh, we advise uh, body corporates to have rules uh, done by uh, informed uh, companies or individuals to ensure that you get the proper rules that would stand the test of time in the future. Of course, these rules with a plan that we discussed must be submitted to CSOS for approval, and they will only become uh, ballot once they have been approved by CSOS. So the fact that you have prepared them or you submitted them doesn't give you the right to, to uh, use those rules. So start early and uh, prepare your scheme for, uh, for solar uh, to be uh, uh, put onto the roofs or onto the exclusive use areas or common property for that matter. Aubrey, and can I, I just quick can I can yes. I quickly just jump in here? There's something yes. um, that has come up um, in a conversation yesterday that I had with Donnie from We Connect You. Um, and it was specifically regarding section 15B3 um, in respect of levy clearance certificates. Now levy clearance certificates currently just deals with the financial aspects. And the problem that one have with that is that if somebody has installed um, 
panels on the common property and there's now destruction of common property when they remove it um, or there's damage to that effect, then one would not be able in the, in the event of a transfer until such a time as that damage has been quantified, you will not be able then to refuse the issuing of a clearance certificate. So maybe that is also something that needs to be dealt with in the rules. Um, and I will have a chat to Zerlinda and to Karen about that as well, so that we can actually start talking about that as well, so that people understand that they might in, must include in their rules also the authority to withhold until such a time as this damages has been um, fixed and repaired. Because you're going to see a lot of damages when people start removing these panels. They go up and down and up and down the roofs of, of schemes. So yeah, so sorry that I jumped in there. It's just something no, 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 that I came up that from is, a conversation uh, yesterday. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that, Vili. I think that is the end of uh, of, of what we uh, we really have to share for now. Uh, I just check the next slide, but I think yes, that would not be for for me anymore. Uh, Glenn, I think this is now your responsibility. Thanks, Aubrey. Vili, when you said you had a problem, I thought you were talking about load shedding that was coming through, and you were going to cut the whole thing off for us. So <laughs> no, <laughs> the plan, the plan. <laughs> So um, when we start talking about when we start talking about solar energy, there are so many. There's no one way to do it. Um, unfortunately, every complex poses its own challenges. Uh, every homeowner has its own his his or her own agenda or, or, or way of thinking in terms of what they want out of solar. Some people want lights. Some people want hot water. Um, other people want television, other people want just the common property and quite happy to have candlelit dinners. So, so everybody's different, every complex is different. Um, uh, there's no one size fits all, there's no one solution to fit all. Um, I, I am very anti the idea of homeowners prejudicing their billing rights. Um, for for the installation of, of solar. Um, and, and, and my view is that uh, by buying power from a third party, um, whereas you keeping it clean with a municipality is is probably just as risky as, as um, uh, making use of, of, of financing. In fact, it's probably a lot less risky than financing the system and keeping your municipal account operational. Um, the term load shedding um, started in 2008 when we when we all heard of heard of load shedding, and the whole idea with load shedding was was to offload the grid. Once we offload the grid, um, and homes and complexes offloaded the grid to an extent, then we would bring stability into the space. Unfortunately, that sort of didn't go as 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 was planned, and now we sort of sit where we are today. Um, the the chart is a a chart the pie chart below is a, is, a, is a chart that ESCOM put together a couple of years ago, and they broke down in a domestic application where where our energy consumption sits. Um, if you look at the chart, you'll see by, by a long stretch geysers are the biggest monster. Um, there are very few responsible solar suppliers that will arrive and say, right, well let's put everything, including your geyser, onto a onto a solar PV system. Um, and for that reason, a, a, a system that puts power to the whole complex is, is potentially a risk for the complex. Um, if you've got a hundred, if you've got a hundred units and you've got three kilowatts or 3000 watts being supplied per geyser, you need a massive system at millions of rands worth of, of, of power just to, just to look after the geysers and that's not touching on the stoves or anything else. So a one size fitting all is, is, is certainly not the right solution. Philly made reference to um, decentralized systems or smaller systems. Um, Bussi, can I get you to shift on to the next slide, please? Um, uh, I'm gonna come back to that decentralized uh, systems in a second, um, but sort of the understanding of solar and, and it becoming a buzzword, um, is 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 creating a lot of <laughs> a lot of interest from people that are sitting at home doing nothing and now suddenly want to become solo installers. Um, and I think a lot of a lot of what we're seeing and a lot of the challenges that we're seeing with solar 
is as a result of people buying a kit, um, a, a, a kit that is bought from a large reseller or over the internet. They arrive with a kit, stick it on because the salesperson told the, the solar installer that this is the solution that would work without very, very much understanding of, of what actually a solar system is. Um, and when we start looking at solar, there are technically two types of solar. There's solar photovoltaics, which is the generation of power through, through um, solar panels, as we would typically, as, as we would typically call it. Um, and then there's solar thermal. Now, solar thermal is the heating of a fluid. That fluid could be water or milk for pasteurization. It could be heating of a fluid for, for anything. You, they um, use solar thermal for steam generation to run a gas turbine uh, or to run a steam turbine so that you can uh, generate power through a steam turbine. Um, um, the, the panels on the roof are typically a lot, um, a lot less uh, weight. Uh, there's a lot less weight on, on solar PV panels or photovoltaic panels than what they are on, on geysers. But the, the geysers are from a savings perspective far better than, than panels at, at, uh, for in a domestic application. Um, if you can save 40 to 50% of your electrical bill, you're gonna save it by installing a, a solar thermal geyser, which is, is in the bigger picture, the low lying fruit of, of, of solar. The solar photovoltaics will give you what we call security of supply and security of supply being when the lights go out, when there's load shedding, you still have power. The panels themselves won't give you anything. It's the bits and pieces that are coming with it. The batteries, um, the charge controllers, those bits and pieces need to be in place. And especially the batteries at night. You won't get anything without a battery at night or, or, or at load shedding for that matter. Um, and even, even grid tie solar inverters will give you nothing if the grid falls over during load shedding. A grid tie inverter is an inverter that draws life from the grid, and if that grid falls away, so too does the system. We'll see if I can ask you to shift on. Um, sorry, I'm just moving that to the side. The draw of power is, is, is an important thing to understand before you start putting on, on, on any sort of solar systems. Um, I've mentioned that your geyser should not be on your on a solar system unless it's a solar thermal geyser. Your stove should not be on a solar system. The draw of power is too high. Space heating, air cons. You are getting Samsung that are bringing out these extremely efficient air conditioners. But the rule of thumb in a domestic environment, air conditioner shouldn't be on. Same too as underfloor heating. A toaster and a kettle is something that can go on. They're not really, they don't draw a huge amount of power, um, although they do draw a significant amount of power, but it's for a short space of time. An air fryer or a countertop oven would draw a, a similar type of power to a kettle or a toaster, but it would draw it for three, four hours while you're doing cooking or something. And that has, a, that has an impact on your on your storage capacity. If you've only got four kilowatts and you're pulling an hour of kilo, uh, one kilowatt of, of power an hour and you're running it for four hours, well, you've got a problem. Um, so it's very important to understand what you want to make use of. A tumble dryer is another device that has an element or resistance heater in it, and that too shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be uh, made use of. I've, I've mentioned the hairdryer here, and a hairdryer is somewhere between about a thousand watts. And the significance of a hairdryer, which we probably not really think much about, but if you had 500 in a 500 unit complex and you had 50 hairdryers going at the same time, there's a hell of a lot of power going on there. And if everybody typically gets up for work at six o'clock in the morning and, and is moving by, by half past seven to get to work by eight o'clock, the potential that there are 50 hairdryers going in and going on in a complex at the same time is quite high, especially in a complex of, of, of 500 units. Um, if you've got a system that is, is, is driven by batteries and, and a centralized system, which I'll touch on in a second, you have, you have a power problem. You, have, you would need to have a significant amount of power 
just to take care of those hair dryers all going on at the same time. We'll see if I can ask you to shift to the next one. So, so centralized system. What, I, what, I, what do I mean when I talk about a centralized system? A centralized system is a system that injects power, as you can see by the red line, behind the complexes meter, but in front of the meter before every single unit. It doesn't change the consumption or draw of power from the unit at all. All it does is it supplements the grid that comes from the mains with additional power. The draw remains the same behind the meter that services the homeowner. So if you're injecting power into the grid of the complex, you're not affecting the draw of power from the homeowner. You keep the draw of power the same. The difference is he just needs to buy that power or make use of that power or some agreement needs to be in place in order to finance the installation of a centralized system. So, so, so a centralized system just injects power into the, into the grid of the complex and doesn't do much in terms of consumption for the homeowner. Um, if we go to the next slide, is, is in a decentralized solution, you inject power not onto the common property grid of the complex, but you inject power into the individual's dwellings. I've put the top one there as the guardhouse. I've put the next one as unit one, as unit two. And you inject power into the unit itself in some or other fashion, whether it be by, by solar panels or by a solar geyser. You don't inject power from a solar geyser, but you offset power by a solar geyser. And that offsetting saves the homeowner money because the power enters the unit from behind his meter. It also affects the body corporate meter um, because the homeowners or the units are all using less power. So you're offsetting the body corporate's common property or the, the, the body corporate's individual bulk meter by saving power behind the meters of the homeowners. And it's an important, it's an important thing to understand where you, where you inject that power because a decentralized system and smaller systems, as, as Billy touched on, um, are far more reliable, far more stable than having a centralized system. It might appear to be you know, a far greater idea to have a, a centralized system, but if a single fuse were to blow on a centralized system, potentially you could have your whole system going down. Whereas if you decentralized your system and something were to go wrong with unit one, it probably only affects, it definitely only affects unit one and not unit, all the units. So understanding where your service provider is going to inject power into your complex and in which position is, 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 is critically important. Um, I'm also far more, far more excited about the idea of decentralized power when you're looking at a complex as a whole. Um, Vili touched on the idea that smaller systems throughout the complex would be would be far better but many smaller systems mean you could have a system that's dedicated for your electric fence you could have a system that's dedicated for your common property lighting you could have a system that's dedicated for your guardhouse um, and all of these smaller systems potentially mean that there's a there's far more reliability of power and stability um, throughout the complex if the cameras go down while well, your electric fence is still working if your electric fence goes down for whatever reason, you've still perhaps got cameras up or, 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 or you can start getting the guards moving around, but you would still have lighting. So depending on, on, on the layout of the complex, depending on the, the needs and the wants of the, of the homeowners, um, understanding where you're going to uh, inject power, the type of system, whether it's a centralized system or a decentralized system, are really key components for the trustees making decisions as to what sort of system they want to in, uh, introduce into the complex. Um, if you shift to the next slide, please. Um, I think the biggest thing that I, I don't want to do is, is push my own personal 
thoughts onto anybody in terms of how we should be doing it, but really about how a complex or trustees or managing agents should be looking at complex and solar power. And I think the most important thing to take away from it is that there's no one size fits all. The right way to do it is to introduce a service provider into the space, allow him to walk around, introduce a few service providers into the space, allow him to walk around, have a look at the different aspects that you want to power and consider what best suits, suits you. Um, and I think that's it from me. Thank you, Glenn. Um, I just want to jump in here. I see that we've had, we've received quite a number of questions about city and we ran out of time. Um, and we've really tried to just go over it as fast as possible. I mean, it's such a vast subject. Um, and there's so much that can be discussed around this. And we've just tried to touch on all the little aspects. Um, so maybe we will have to look at that uh, at a later stage and, and bring another webinar in and a couple of more points that we can raise but regarding the questions we will yeah. definitely take the questions and we will um, answer them myself glenn and aubrey will um, answer those things and we will send them out to everybody that was on the webinar um, so we will definitely answer those questions for you um, so thank you so much. Thanks for, for joining us again. Um, we hope that we've shown you some insight into all the problems that we are going to experience and that we as citizens in this country need to tackle to, to sort our lives out and to, to sort our schemes out. Um, so thanks for, for joining us again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you for the time.